going if folks want to take a seat. Or if you want to stand, that's OK, too. Simulated condition on the muni bus. Yes, yoga is allowed. OK, can, you can hear me all right? OK, well, good evening, everyone. Welcome. Thank you very much for taking time out of, uh, out of your evening. I'm sure there's other things that you could be doing with your time, but very much appreciate your taking the time to be here. My name's Ed Riskin. I'm the Director of Transportation here at the SFMTA. And we are using this and other venues to provide an opportunity to share uh, our budget process with you, the public, and to get some feedback from you, hopefully, as well, as we deliberate and work towards delivering a balanced budget to City Hall by May 1st. So I have a presentation that I'm going to walk through to try to explain uh, the process, the operating budget, the capital budget, and then the, the balance of the evening for as long as anybody wants to stay is really for you. It's for you to ask questions, to provide feedback, to give us your opinions, to help us prioritize. That's the purpose of this evening. So without further ado, I'm going to start walking through this. Um, th this is what I'm going to cover, uh, a little bit about the agency, um, about our budget, our status, what some opportunities we have are uh, with this budget, uh, and then next steps. And again, really the important part for, for me will be uh, questions that you have and, and feedback that you have. So you probably all know um, the scope of what we do here at the MTA. We're the city's transportation department. We do transportation planning and engineering responsible for bike and pedestrian safety, uh, parking and traffic management. We also operate Muni, the nation's seventh largest transit system. We regulate the taxi industry. So altogether, uh, we have a pretty broad responsibility for surface transportation functions in the city, which is pretty unique around the country. In most places, those functions are scattered and split. We have it all here, thanks to initiatives of the voters of San Francisco, all here under one roof and one agency. The slide shows some of the assets that we are responsible for maintaining, uh, some other stats, such as the amount of service that we provide. Uh, not, to, not meant to be a comprehensive list, but really just to give you a sense of kind of the scale and scope of what we are responsible for managing and, and for delivering. So how do we manage such a big and diverse scope? Uh, the way we do it primarily is within the framework of a strategic plan. The SFMTA Board of Directors, um, the agency is governed by a seven-member Board of Directors that are appointed by the mayor. And that Board of Directors adopted a strategic plan about two years ago, covering from fiscal year 2013 to fiscal year 2018. Uh, that plan is really the guiding document that is meant to guide our budget decisions, our operational decisions, our policy decisions, our resource allocation decisions. So this is really what's guiding us, uh, the programs, the processes, the services. It's really the strategic plan. And uh, there is a document that, that is the plan, but uh, really kind of the core of the plan is the vision, um, which is uh, San Francisco is a great city with excellent transportation choices. Um, and that's recognizing the important role that transportation plays here in San Francisco and the desire of the agency for people in San Francisco to have lots of good options that they can make so that they can make choices that contribute to San Francisco being a great city. The board adopted four goals as part of the strategic plan and that's really what's driving the work of this agency. The first goal is about safety, and, the, and they chose this goal as the first goal intentionally uh, because safety of the transportation system is the most important thing. No matter what else we do to try to help people move around the city, we need to make sure that people can get around the city safely, whether they're on foot, whether they're on a bike, whether they're on a bus, whether they're driving a bus, driving a car, 
we want people to be able to get around the city safety, safely. That's our number one, <clears throat> number one goal. The second goal is really meant to be a actualization of the city's transit first policy, <clears throat> which was adopted by the Board of Supervisors back in 1973 and is now in the city charter and our responsibility as an agency to implement. And that's really to make transit biking, walking, and other sustainable modes of transportation more attractive and better options for people in San Francisco. The third goal reflects the role that the transportation pl system plays in the city's economy and quality of life and, and contributing to the health of the environment. Uh, so we have a goal focused on that. And then the fourth goal is really about our own workforce <clears throat> and our agency uh, and the needs that we've recognized to support, empower, and strengthen the workforce so that the agency is a great place to work, so that folks are motivated and productive and can achieve those other three goals. So that's the strategic plan. That's the framework uh, within which we are uh, managing the agency and the framework within which we are developing this budget. So just some things that, that we're doing that are underway uh, in in line with those goals. Um, obviously the, the core, and you'll see this when we look at the budget slides, the, the core of the agency is Muni. It's the, the biggest part of the agency. It's what moves the most people uh, in the city. Um, so one of the core things we're doing is working hard in many different ways to improve Muni service, to improve how we manage it, to improve the infrastructure it relies on, to improve how we communicate with people about it. Uh, to make it a more attractive means of travel for more people and for more trips. We are, um, as I said, improving communications uh, to people. Um, it's not just about the, the buses and the trains, but it's about the information people have about when the bus is coming, when the train is coming, if there's a problem, if there's a disruption out in the streets. Um, so we've been working on improving our website. We have a Twitter feed. We have an alert system. Uh, we have Nextbus. Uh, the next bus system, uh, trying to put more and better and timely information in the hands of people who want to ride Muni so that it works better for them and they can plan better. Uh, part of what we're talking here today about um, is the, the fiscal management of the agency. We have developed a 20-year plan, a 20-year capital plan. Uh, wherein we look at all of those assets, all of the buses and the traffic signals and the stop signs and the overhead wires. We evaluate what the state of them is, what the needs to bring them into a state of good repair or to replace them or rehabilitate them is over the course of 20 years as the overarching frame uh, for how we're gonna be good stewards of these many assets that the public has entrusted us to manage. Um, from that comes our five-year capital improvement program and our two-year capital budget, which we'll be talking about today. And then the operating budget are the funds that we use each year to operate the agency, to provide the Muni service, to design the improvements in the right-of-way, to work on making the city's transportation system safer. Um, we're also working to improve the other modes, the more sustainable modes of transportation in San Francisco, working to improve taxi service, putting more taxis on the street, uh, trying to improve the quality of taxi service, trying to make them easier to access, um, such as through um, a new electronic, electronic hailing system uh, that we're putting into place now. In terms of bike and pedestrian safety, we've been hearing a lot about that in the news lately, seeing a lot of uh, really unfortunate collisions happening that are taking people's lives or that are seriously hurting people that should not be happening in our great city. So we're working hard to develop and implement improvements in the bike and pedestrian network and our streets generally so that people getting around on bike uh, or on foot, which we all do, we all get around on foot so that we can all do so safely. Um, and, and lastly, admit, but maybe most importantly, we're really trying to change and improve and transform the way that we engage with the public we serve uh, and the people who pay our salaries, the, the people who pay their muni fares, um, the, the, our customers, the people of San Francisco. Uh, I think we have a, a great opportunity in this agency to much better, 
more proactively, more systematically, um, better connect with people, not just for us to uh, talk to people, but for us to engage in dialogue with people to get feedback from the public, to make sure that we're understanding uh, not just what's in the best interest of the transportation system from a technical perspective, but for what's really gonna work for the people of San Francisco, for businesses, uh, for residents. So those are just examples of some things we're working on to advance the strategic plan. You can see there's numbers there that relate to the goals that uh, I mentioned on the previous slide. These are the things we're doing to move the agency forward. So what we're talking about here today primarily is the budget. Um, and the budget really is the strategic plan as a guiding framework. framework. The, the budget is one of the main policy documents that any organization has. It's not just numbers on a piece of paper. It's, it's the policy document that helps set the priorities uh, for the fiscal cycle in our case, <clears throat> which is two years. Our fiscal cycles uh, start every even July 1, every even year July 1. So July 1, 2014 through June 30th, 2016 uh, is, is the fiscal cycle that we're talking about now that we're developing. So the budget process is what we're in now. It's when we uh, work uh, with the public, with our board, uh, with our staff to bring forward a, a budget that balances the revenues that we can anticipate and the expenditures that we expect to have. Um, and that's, that's basically what we're doing now. The budget is, is where you bring those two together and balance them. And uh, like most other organizations and everybody else except the federal government, we need to balance our budget every year. And we are required by charter to submit a balanced budget to the Board of Supervisors and the mayor by May 1st of every even numbered year. So starting with the operating budget, here's a picture of what the budget looks like from a revenue perspective. Uh, it's on the order of the revenue projections right now are on the order of $930, $950 million. Uh, pretty, pretty big operating budget. The, uh, the breakdown of the revenues is about a quarter of those revenues come from muni fares, from transit fares. About a quarter of the revenues come directly from a pass-through of general fund revenues, so your property taxes, hotel tax, trans real estate transfer tax, uh, those taxes that go into the general fund um, by formula in the charter, um, a portion of those are directed to us. We have actually the single biggest set aside of funds in, of, of general funds in the city budget. They're funds that go to open space and to childcare and to libraries. The biggest set aside is the one that comes to us to operate Muni and the rest of the transportation system. So that's about another quarter. Quarter transit fares, about a quarter general fund. Then about a third of it is from parking. And that's from parking meters, it's from parking citations, and we also get a share of the city's off-street parking tax. There's a 25% tax that the city levies on off-street parking, we get 80% of that tax. Those three things together represent about a third of our budget. Um, then we do have a, a little bit that we get in operating grants, uh, some from the state, uh, and a little bit from our local half cent sales tax, which funds our paratransit program. Um, that accounts for the rest along with some smaller miscellaneous things such as advertising, uh, taxi permit revenues and the like. But the, the big categories, transit fares, general fund, parking, that's the majority of our budget. And I guess what I would say within those, the general fund revenues are the amount of those we don't control. Uh, except very indirectly to the extent that transportation is an important part of economic vitality in the city. When the economy is doing better, we get more general fund revenues. When the economy is doing worse, we get less. So we have an indirect role in those. Uh, transit fares uh, we set, we establish, so we have a little bit more control over those. Uh, parking revenues, aside from the parking tax, uh, the parking site meter fees, and citation amounts uh, we set, so we have some control over those as well. Uh, so that was the revenue side, this is the expenditure side. 
Um, and this is just the, the baseline buzz budget. This is not a proposed budget. This is basically taking what we know this year and uh, rolling it forward uh, to the next two years. So the totals, are they the same? They're not the same. So there, there must be some, okay, so, th so this is the baseline. So, so these are the revenues that we're projecting for next year. And these are the expenditures. If you just take what we're doing this year and roll forward, and I'll show you what's included and what's not included, these are what the expenditures uh, look like. And you'll see that these are lower, meaning that our baseline, we show, we show a little surplus. On the expenditures, you can see Muni is uh, the largest part of the budget, more than half of the agency's budget. And then Sustainable Streets, uh, which has many of the functions that some of you may know as Department of Parking and Traffic, DPT, um, is the next biggest chunk. That's where the bike and pedestrian safety, the transportation planning and engineering, parking and traffic management enforcement, all of that is in, within Sustainable Streets. Um, another big category, something amorphously called agency-wide, um, that's uh, general agency expenses. It's things like insurance, it's our legal fees, it's some of the money that we pay to the city for HR services, for payroll services, for the city controller services, for the city treasurer's services, it's things like that. It's kind of like overhead expenses for the agency that support all of the operating divisions. And then re that, that really accounts for most of it. Then our finance and information technology uh, group that manages all this money as well as all of our technology and our real estate manages our procurement, um, runs the customer service center downstairs, the, the muni kiosks that collect the money, um, and then a, a number of other smaller divisions, but the, the big chunk being muni, uh, the next chunk being the parking, traffic, bike and pedestrian safety, um, agency-wide and finance. So that's our baseline expenditures, again, taking what we have this year, rolling it forward with a few adjustments. A few things that we're assuming in the baseline different from this year, assuming some, some adjustments in a good direction uh, based on trends that we're seeing. Uh, we think our, basically the amount we're paying out in settlements and judgments is, is gonna go down a little bit. Uh, our workers' comp claims uh, have been going down, uh, I, I'd like to think, because of uh, increased focus on workplace safety. Uh, the more we keep people from getting hurt in the first place, the less that we're paying uh, later for doctors uh, through workers' comp. That's been, uh, we've reversed the trend, an upward trend of a few years, and it's starting to come down now. And we had set aside previously uh, money that we were allocating instead of spending on services, we were basically putting aside in reserve. And we were doing that because our, uh, like any organization, we, uh, or any fiscally responsible one, we had and have a policy, a fiscal policy that requires us to keep an equivalent of about 10% of operating needs in reserve. So on an $800 million budget, we would need $80 million in reserve for emergencies, for disasters, uh, just if, in case uh, funding sources don't come in as planned so that we can basically keep the, the trains running. Uh, so, we, But we had drawn down on that reserve during the recession. So as the economy was recovering in the last couple of years, we've been refunding, putting money back into the reserve. So because we've now met that 10% requirement, uh, according to our own fiscal policies, we no longer need to add additional funding into the reserve. So here's some things that are in the baseline budget that have moved in the other direction. So there are a number of labor costs that uh, were not fully realized in the previous budget. Uh, a big chunk of our uh, organization, or the people represented in our organization, as well as really throughout the city, uh, we entered into labor agreements with a couple years ago that gave them some staggered raises. There was a 1% raise after a year, and then another 1% after a half a year, and another 1% after another three months. So when you annualize that to 3% raise for all of those, that was probably two or 3,000 employees, um, that has a cost when it's annualized into the budget, along with uh, a number of attendant 
costs, such as premium pays and holiday pays, things that are in the union contracts. Um, down below, there's also fringe benefit increases that we're seeing generally. Uh, the cost of benefits, such as health care, are rising faster than inflation. So we need to account for that in our base budget, again, assuming the same, more or less same number of employees. Going back up, there are a number of contracts that are moving forward. There are new services we're putting in place uh, or new things we're doing that, that have some cost. There are things we're doing in, in taxi. There are things we're doing to better manage our garages and our parking meters. Uh, there are payments that we make to BART and Caltrain. They're relatively small, but some of those have increased. All of that together represents an increase over the current budget. Um, there are some, there are capital, uh, there are capital funds coming from, from kind of different sources, impact fees that we get from uh, development and neighborhoods. Uh, now that the economy is picking up, some of those impact fees are starting to flow into our budget. So those are uh, additional both on the revenue side and the expenditure side. Um, and then finally, uh, work orders is, is the term we use uh, to describe the process by which we pay for other agencies to provide us service. So we, we pay the city attorney's office to provide us legal service. We, provide, we pay the police department to provide muni security. Um, we pay a number of different agencies to do different things. Um, so we've put a kind of placeholder expecting um, that because of costs increasing like ours did for city staff, that those costs will go up as well. So those things are assumed <clears throat> in the base budget. There are a number of things, though, that are not assumed. And when we go uh, later and we show a surplus, we have to keep in mind there's things that are not assumed in this year's, in the baseline budget. First and most importantly, of our 5,000 employees, just about all 5,000 now are represented by unions whose collective bargaining agreements are expiring on June 31st, which means we are now in the process of negotiating new labor agreements uh, for almost the entirety of our workforce. We don't know yet uh, whether what the cost of that will be. It's likely there will be a cost. I'll note that for our transit operators, which is about 2,000 of our 5,000 employees, uh, they have had no wage increase in the last three years, uh, zero, not a cost of living, nothing. So they've been flat for three years as the economy and the cost of li living has really picked up. So we can anticipate that that will probably be a non-zero number, that will be, will be a cost as a result of our negotiations, but we don't yet know what, what that cost will be. Um, th there's something that, that we refer to as our structural deficit. And try to explain what we mean by that. In order, say, to provide muni service uh, or to maintain our street infrastructure, uh, but let's stick with muni service. We, we need a bus and a driver to be out there on the street to pick up passengers. But there are a lot of, there's a lot of resources behind that bus and driver to make it work. There's the person who trains the driver, who supervises the driver, the person who cleans the bus, the per person who fixes the bus, the person who cleans the restrooms that the operator and the other employees use. So there's all these other costs that if we were fully resourcing the system, commensurate with the level of service we're providing, uh, we would be resourcing that at a level, level higher than we are today. Because when times were difficult, and we didn't want to cut service, we cut a lot of those other supporting services. So we have a, a deficit in that regard on the order of $50 million that if we were to fully provide the level of maintenance we think we should be providing, the level of janitorial services, cleaning services, training, supervision, uh, we would have a lot more expenditure. Uh, we haven't anticipated any work order reductions. Uh, that's those payments to other city agencies, though we're always looking at ways that we can reduce the cost of those services. One significant thing that we have not included yet in our base budget is any increase in transit service. Any of you who ride Muni know that there are many of our Muni lines that are very crowded, that there's a lot more demand for Muni service than service that we're providing. The baseline assumes the same level of service, 
yet I think the demand from any person's perspective demands more service. In the baseline budget, we, we have not anticipated any additional service. Um, and then finally, uh, all those other divisions, the, the folks who are working on bike and pedestrian safety, our communications function, uh, which has not been strong enough in the past, uh, technology services, there are lots of other things um, that we think we could do to enhance the service we provide <clears throat> to advance our strategic plan. None of those things are included in the baseline budget. So I just want to try to be real clear about what's in the baseline versus then what we might do beyond what's in the baseline. So accounting for where we, where we are this year, things that we've accounted for in terms of savings, things that we've accounted for in terms of increases, and keeping in mind all the things that we are not accounting for in the baseline, we start off with revenues exceeding ex expenditures. So our baseline budget uh, starts us off positively for the first time for this agency or for the city in many, many years. So that's a good thing. We're starting off at a much better place than we were two years ago or four years ago or six years ago, uh, which is a great thing. It's a great place for us to start. But, but so we have, basically, if we don't change on the revenue side, for example, we have $22 million more we could spend in the first fiscal year, 15 million more in the second year. Uh, and remember, but remember, here are the things that aren't included in those numbers. The, the structural gap is on the order of $50 million. So if we wanted to close that gap, we would more than wipe out that surplus. If we want to add muni service, if you look at the $500 million muni budget, just in simple terms, if we wanted to increase service by 10%, that would be $50 million also. That would more than wipe out that, uh, that projected surplus. So we're starting in a good place, but we also have a lot of needs that we're gonna try to address. So I mentioned transit fares, about a quarter of our budget is one thing that, that we have you know, more or less complete control over. Um, obviously anything we do has, um, has to face the reality of the marketplace if we raise fares really high, maybe people wouldn't ride and our fare revenues would, would decline. So we have control within limits, but it is something we control. Um, historically, the fares stayed flat for a long time until deficits built up big. And then whatever governing board was governing Muni at the time would hike the fares way up. And then we go along for a long time and do it again. Uh, after the last time, when fast passes went from 45 to $60, uh, the MTA Board of Directors decided this is not a good way to provide a sustainable, predictable source of revenue. We know our expenses go up every year. The revenue, the main revenue that we control should go up every year too. So they implemented an indexing policy and have now since applied it to all of our fares, fees, and fines that basically index up by inflation. There is some rounding, so some things like the $2 fare had not previously gone up for a few years because we round to the nearest quarter. Our, our passes, we round to the nearest dollar, but generally fares index up over time. Parking citation fees index up over time. Permit costs index up over time so that uh, we're, we have a consistent, systematic, predictable way of seeing where our revenues are gonna go that is in line with where we can expect our expenditures to go. That's a good fiscally responsible thing. It's predictability not only for us, but for anybody who's paying any of these fees, fines, or fares. It's also something that the capital markets really appreciate. The, the voters gave us authority to issue debt, uh, recognizing that our capital needs were so great that we couldn't fund those needs with our operating budget alone. When we went out to the credit markets to get a credit rating to issue debt, this indexing policy was one of the things that uh, they felt made us a strong, made us a fiscally strong, financially strong agency and enabled us to get pretty good credit ratings, which means that we can get low interest rates when we do issue debt to do some of the capital work to improve the assets that we have. So the indexing policy, generally speaking, a very good thing, I think, 
for everyone, not that anyone likes fees, fines, and fares to go up, but they're going up gradually, predictably, um, in a way that's very helpful to, for us to keep track of, ex keep on top of expenditure. So our options when we look at fares, the default is just to let the indexing proceed um, as planned, and uh, you can look up, uh, we have online, if not here, posted for every fee, fine, and fair, what it is now and what it would go to next year and what it would go to the following year were we to let indexing advance as we have done the last two fiscal cycles, more or less. Um, there are things that we have options about. Well, we have options about all of them, but there's some options that we were putting on the table for consideration and would love your feedback on some of these places where maybe it would make sense to deviate from the indexing. So here's some examples that I'll walk through. Uh, we may want to increase some fares beyond indexing, recognizing a different level of service that they're providing re relative to the rest of Muni service. We might want to hold some certain fares down or reduce them, recognizing the affordability crisis that we're having in our city. And we might want to defer certain increases to try to incentivize a switch uh, away from cash, which is expensive for us to manage and process. So those are some three ideas that we've had. Um, in terms of special fares, the first one, there are some lines that I would argue provide a different level of service that, than your average Muni line. Uh, for example, the F line. The F line is a, um, it's a historic, it's a tourist attraction. Um, it's a very specialized service. Sometimes when we have a lot of, when we want to run more F-line service and we don't have historic streetcars, we supplement it with buses. And a lot of times people will let the bus go by and wait to get on one of those beautifully restored historic vehicles. It's a, it's a different kind of service, you could argue, uh, because of these special handcrafted restored vehicles um, that I think some people would have a willingness to pay more for. Um, so one of the ideas is to raise the fare of the F-line uh, above what indexing would call for. So maybe raise it to $3 or 4 or 5 or even $6 for a single ride fare. Uh, like the cable car, a month on, in this scenario, a monthly pass, uh, you would still pay the same price as anybody else. So for any regular rider that uses a monthly pass, there would be no impact to this. It would apply to single ride fares, uh, which is predominantly tourists, uh, or at least the presumption is it's predominantly tourists. We've actually gotten some feedback from locals who say, I ride the F a lot, but I don't buy a pass, so this would adversely impact me. Um, so anyway, that's the idea and the, the, the rationale behind that. We've gotten a lot of, I'd say, pretty strong adverse feedback to that idea, but it's one we're putting out there. Um, the express buses, these are the buses, the X's, the AX's, the BX's, uh, that rather than making all the way, making stops all the way into the city, uh, pick up folks and then express uh, across the city. So it's a much faster, a much different, uh, sometimes a more reliable ride than your average Muni service, which stops uh, every couple of blocks. So the uh, you know, one idea here would be right now we have two different monthly passes. Uh, one is just for Muni, one is for Muni plus BART within, within San Francisco. It's about $10 more. So one of the ideas is how about we say if you want to use your pass on an express bus, you pay that higher, you pay that differential at 10 or so dollars more. Again, reflecting that it's a different, uh, maybe better service. The, the last one, and this one is uh, really just uh, the visitors. We have these fare products that are called passports kind of unlimited rides for one day, for three days, for seven days. Um, we, we could raise those up a little bit higher than indexing would, would suggest. You know, a lot of people use these to ride cable cars and the F-line, uh, real novelties that I think people are maybe less price sensitive to when they're on vacation. So one idea is to maybe raise those up a little bit more. Uh, that the next category has to do with affordability. Again, we've been reading every day about what people are terming, and I think is real for a lot of people, an affordability crisis in San Francisco. The mayor has tasked every department with looking at ways that they can contribute 
to making San Francisco more affordable. Two of the biggest costs that people have in their household budget is housing and transportation. There's probably less that we can do on the housing side, but there are things we can do on the transportation side. And not just with lowering the cost, but to the extent that our transportation service we provide is better, to the extent that we're successful in implementing the transit first policy, we can help people reduce their reliance on an automobile, which is a much more expensive mode of travel than walking, riding a bike, or riding Muni. So there, there's general, there's inherent affordability in our mission, but beyond that, some things that we've been looking at. Um, we made the slide before Google stepped forward today and offered to fund free Muni for low and in, moderate income youth for another two, two years. So that one has kind of been taken care of for us. Uh, though there's been a, a lot of discussion about expanding that program to 18 year olds, expanding our youth fair generally, but including the free and um, free Muni for low and moderate income youth to 18 year olds, since many 18 year olds are still in high school. That's something we could do. Um, we could do the same for seniors, people with disabilities of low and moderate income. We could eliminate, reduce or eliminate the fare for those folks. Many people in those categories are on fixed incomes or being maybe squeezed more than others as costs of living in San Francisco are generally escalating. So we could bring that program to them as well. Of course, these things would all reduce revenues. Uh, the Lifeline fare is our half price fare for low income adults. Um, it's 50% of, of full fare for a monthly pass. We could reduce that further, discount it beyond 50%. Um, and maybe if, if we were to, the last point is, if we were to make Muni free for, uh, for low and moderate income youths and or seniors and people with disabilities, we could increase the cost of Muni for what would be left, the high income youth and or seniors and people with disabilities up to a 50% discount which is more consistent with how many other transit agencies do it. That would offset a little bit uh, the revenue loss. The idea being we'd be trying to move towards a system where we're pricing transit based more on need than based on age. So high income kids or family, kids from high income families who can afford to pay, uh, maybe asking them to pay half fare instead of a third of the fare wouldn't be unreasonable. And then finally, I, I mentioned cash, which is expensive for us to process. Uh, there are some agencies, and I'm told Chicago is about 90% cash free. London is going 100% cash free. Here in San Francisco, we're about 45% cash free. Uh, so to try to induce more people to use electronic fare media, to use Clipper card, uh, what we could do, uh, as an example, is let the cash fare index to $2.25, where it is scheduled to go, unless the board acts otherwise, um, but hold it at $2 if you're using a Clipper card. That way there's an incentive to use a Clipper card instead of cash. It's a choice we would need to make sure that people have access to Clipper cards and to reloading Clipper cards, but it would be a way to try to create an incentive without creating a more financial burden for people to switch. Um, something that we also would want to make sure that doesn't disproportionately impact any, any part uh, of the people, any community that we serve. So that's kind of the, I, I guess the other thing I, I didn't uh, really talk about, really the big one is Muni service. The other thing that we have on the table uh, that we would like to do, as I mentioned, is increase Muni service where we've been undertaking a process over many years called the Transit Effectiveness Project, which has been looking systematically at how Muni operates and making recommendations about how to make it function better and better serve the people that ride it and people that maybe would like to ride it but don't because it's not reliable enough. So the TEP would is striving to provide more service where it's needed and to make Muni uh, work better as it makes its way through the streets of San Francisco uh, in terms of the more service, it's recommending a 10% service increase, which as I mentioned would be probably on the order of about $50 million. We would like, to the extent we can, to start phasing that, that service increase in. So that's another option on the operating budget side 
that is kind of on the table for our board to consider. So, but before we go to the capital, the things to think about on the revenue side, there are things that we can do with fares going up or down. And then on the expenditure side, uh, there's trying to close that structural gap by providing for, for more maintenance, for more cleaning, for more repairs, uh, or just putting the money to increase muni service or doing some combination of the both, as well as funding some of our other needs, increased communications capability, better technology. Those are the things we're weighing on the operating budget. And the capital budget. Uh, we actually, we don't have sources uh, here, but our capital budget is funded, uh, a big chunk of it is funded through federal funds that are targeted specifically in many cases towards transit. Uh, there are also state and local funds. We have a half cent sales tax here for transportation, a good chunk of which flows through our capital budget, as well as some of our own revenue, such as the revenue bonds I measured, mentioned. Um, these are the, the priorities we have in our capital budget. Uh, the first is to invest in the core, what we call state of good repair, uh, of the, the core part of our, of our system, primarily the transit system. That's the buses and the trains and the rails and the overhead wires and signals and switches, uh, as well as our traffic signals, um, making sure that they are in good shape. And we've, we've, ident we've identified a need of about $250 million a year just to keep those in good shape or bring them in to good shape, in some cases compensating for many years of lack of investment in those, in those assets. And, and why this is important is, and especially when we think about things like adding more immunity service, um, it's kind of like, it's kind of like the, the capital need to the state of good repair of the assets. It's like, if you think of it like your house, you need a strong foundation, you need a good plumbing system, you need an updated electrical system, you need well insulated walls if your house is gonna be a nice place to live. If you don't have those things, if your foundation is crumbling, if the electrical system's shorting, your plumbing is leaking, your walls are drafty, that's probably not, the, the, the next thing to do probably isn't to add an addition to your house because you're just gonna have more space that's not desirable. So the, the, this is why this is so important. Bef you know, as we think about wanting to increase service, which we absolutely wanna do, we wanna get the system we do have into better shape, because just by doing so, will effectively increase service. And the reason is because when we have, uh, with all the buses and trains we have out there, and the rails and overhead wires and signals and switches, when those fail, that causes a, a diminution of service. When we have to pull a bus out of service, we have to wait for the emergency repair vehicle to show up, that's service that we're not providing. So by getting our buses and our trains and all that infrastructure in good shape, we keep the service on the road more. So we effectively increase the service without adding a single bus or a single driver. So some, that's why this capital investment, it it's maybe feels less tangible than just, say, adding service or putting in more bike lanes. That's why this part is so critical, and it's really our, our top priority. Uh, our, our other top priority is uh, building and ma maintaining safe and complete streets. Talked about bike and pedestrian safety. Our roadways were largely designed to move and store private vehicles and, and just to move vehicles at, as quickly and efficiently as possible. Uh, based on uh, the amount of people we have walking and biking and getting around in other ways in the city, uh, based on where, where we see the future of how people will get around the city, we need to redesign our rights of way to make them safer for people who are on foot, who are on a bike, who are on transit, uh, and who are driving. We need to make it safer for all road users. So there's investment we need to make to make those changes in the right of way. In some cases, to reallocate space on the right of way uh, to give more protection to some of those more vulnerable users. So that's really a core part uh, of what we do. That's where the traffic calming is. That's where enhancing crosswalks are, adding traffic signals where we don't have them, putting in stop signs. That's a core priority for us. And then finally, and, and this is circling back to the transit effectiveness project that I mentioned, part of it is adding more service and part of it is making the service that we have uh, move better through the city. So that could be dedicating lanes to transit, making more transit only lanes. 
It could be uh, widening the sidewalk where we have bus stops so the buses don't have to pull out of traffic and then fight their way back in. Uh, it could be replacing stop signs with signals and then having the, the transit vehicles talk to the signals to hold a green light so that they're not stopping at every stop sign, uh, but instead getting a green light as they travel. It could be putting in turn pockets, so turning car, cars waiting to make a turn aren't blocking the muni bus with hundreds of people that are, that's trying to go straight. So there are changes we can make in the right of way, uh, not just to make the streets safer, but also to help Muni move better and more efficiently through the streets to make it better for the people who ride it and more attractive for the people who don't. So the good news is that our five-year projection and we, we do uh, our capital planning in five-year chunks, uh, represents a pretty good increase from what it was just two years ago. Uh, you can see the, some of the elements, uh, the fleet uh, number is increasing pretty significantly. FGW, uh, it's fixed guideway, that's the rails and overhead wires that support the, the trains and the trolley system. Uh, transit optimization and expansion, that's some of these enhancements in the, in the right-of-way to make the system work better. It's transit signal priority, things like that. Uh, the green, you can see a, a nice increase in bicycle and pedestrian safety. I think it's more than a tripling of funding for that, we anticipate. Um, and then the central subway project, our big capital project, that's actually shrinking a little bit because some of the expenditures are behind us as that, pro as that progresses, that progresses through the city and the project gets built. One of the main reasons for that jump, if you look over on the right, is that, uh, I'm not good with colors, that tan, that middle part that says TTF, nearly $600 million. TTF is Transportation Task Force. This is an effort that was initiated by Mayor Lee last year in his State of the City speech. He said he wanted to focus on addressing transportation funding needs that he recognized from his time back as public works director and as the architect of the city's capital plan as something that we hadn't addressed in the city, the way we've started to address our libraries and our parks and recreation centers and our hospitals and health centers, police stations, fire stations. We've started to turn around uh, the trend of letting those assets decline. Uh, he recognized that we needed to do the same for transportation and what he proposed uh, was much as he did to address pension reform, business tax reform, affordable housing funding. He proposed to bring together a large group of stakeholders uh, to understand the issue and to come up with some consensus recommendations. And what you can see they came up with just in this five-year window would represent nearly 20% of our capital budget, new local money. So what, what that task force recommended and they just released their recommendations in November, and the mayor in his State of the City speech this year uh, endorsed at least the first phase of recommendations, which would be uh, measures on the ballot this November. What they recommended are, are basically three funding measures. Uh, one, general obligation bonds, uh, much like we as a city approved uh, for parks twice in the last five years to fund General Hospital, to build a new police headquarters, upgrade our fire stations, uh, to pave our streets. Uh, so general obligation bond, an increase in the vehicle license fee back up to the 2% it was before Governor Schwarzenegger cut it a number of years back, and a new additional half cent sales tax increase altogether that would generate about $3 billion, $2.9 billion of new local revenue um, that would do a number of things uh, that I'll talk about, including leveraging additional revenue. This is a once in a lifetime, once in a generation level of investment in our transportation system, reversing decades of lack of investment that's sorely needed for a service, a system that's so important to our economy, to the environment of San Francisco, and really to our quality of life. So it's really a tremendous opportunity. The proposal from the task force that has been endorsed by the mayor are, is to advance uh, the first few of these to this November's ballot, a $500 million general obligation bond, a, the increase of the vehicle license fee, uh, which would produce additional general tax revenues, and then a charter amendment that would direct 
additional general fund revenues to transportation. So what we would get from that, um, it would allow us to implement much of the transit effectiveness project. This is helping Muni move better through the city streets, which would improve travel times, uh, make your trip faster uh, by up to 20% on the lines that carry about two thirds of our ridership. So focusing on the, the biggest, heaviest use lines uh, to make them more efficient in how they're moving through the city. It would help us expand our fleet. Um, to, we, we need to increase the frequency of service to meet some of the demand. To do that, to some extent, we need more buses and trains. This funding would allow us to start growing the fleet. It would help us upgrade existing infrastructure, um, add more traffic signals and pedestrian countdown signals. Uh, pedestrian countdown signals being one of the most significant and direct ways we can improve pedestrian safety. It would allow us to address infrastructure that's lower down on the priority list than the buses and the trains, uh, but things that are vitally important, such as elevators and escalators and other station improvements and facility improvements. And importantly, it would help us uh, leverage additional regional funding. The MTC, which is the regional transportation agency, the Metropolitan Transportation Commission, has already stepped forward and said, San Francisco, if you advance these measures, if the voters adopt these measures, we will match in part some of that funding with anticipated cap and trade and some other revenue. So we already have the promise of a match if, if, we, can, if we can deliver in November. These measures will also help us meet the goals that I talked about at the outset, the goal of, that's in our strategic plan and that the goal that was established by the Board of Supervisors 41 years ago and placed in the charter. It'll allow us to make it safer to walk in the city, to make it safer to ride your bike in the city, to make transit work better, to make those modes of transportation more attractive so that we get, can get those cars off the road so that the people who need to drive um, can, can do so with less congestion, can find that parking space, um, but so that we can generally move the city more sustainably. Um, and it also will help us provide funding for some of the big, big projects that we have. All of Muni service, not all, a lot of Muni service funnels into Market Street. So all, from many of the neighborhoods we serve, uh, the trip goes through Market Street. We have a lot of congestion, we have safety issues, we have congestion issues, we have conflict of different modes on Market Street. Uh, to fix Market Street, and we do think it's fixable, would require investment to deconflict those modes, to make the transit work better, to make it safer for people to walk and bike. Uh, these measures would allow us to do projects like that and on other corridors as well. So that's, that's kind of the end of the capital budget and really the end of this, where we are in the process. We're having, we're, we've had some public hearings uh, with my board doing some of these sessions, trying to make information available to send out information electronically on our website uh, to create channels for people to give us feedback, uh, particularly on some of the choices we have about adding service, increasing fares, reducing fares, increasing maintenance. Um, and then we go through a series of more formal board hearings. And like I said, we need to submit our budget by May 1st. It then goes into the city budget process during which the Board of Supervisors has an opportunity to review and approve or reject the budget over the next few months, a process that ends at the latest by the end of July. So that's pretty much all I wanted to say. Sorry if that took a, took a little longer maybe than I should. I wanted to try to lay out everything really clearly, and the, the rest of the time is really for you. Um, maybe I'll just leave that up for reference. Uh, now's the time for questions, comments, feedback, recommendations, things I missed. The, the floor is yours for the rest of the evening. And I don't, do we need people to be at the mic? I guess our, the preference is, if you don't mind, to come to the mic so that uh, we're recording this and, I guess, broadcasting this so people can pick it up. If you really don't want to, then I'll just repeat your question.
for your presentation. It was very clear. Um, I have a, it's not a question, well, it is sort of a question, but um, what is the rationale and what are the next steps in terms of rolling back Sunday meters? Um, for the record, I'm opposed to rolling back the meters. I think it's, it's a huge loss of revenue. Um, I don't drive, but my boyfriend does, and we found that we can go to neighborhoods on Sundays that we couldn't go to before, like uh, uh, the Richmond and um, the inner sunset because parking rev parking meters encourage turnover we can find a place to park and um, and also the majority of transit dependent people are very poor so if this is to stop the nickeling and diming um, rolling back Sunday meters is going to have a greater um, is a greater boon to wealthier San Franciscans drivers at the potentially at the expense of the transit dependent populations that are going to see our our fares go up even if there are free youth fares there's still a, a lot of uh, adults that don't fall into any of those discount categories that are going to be impacted by the uh, 25 percent or 25 cent per ride fee okay yeah thanks susan that's a, that's a great question um let me start by saying the, the reasons, uh, all of the reasons that you said that you think um, enforcement of parking meters on Sundays makes sense are the reasons why the MTA board adopted that two years ago. It's to create availability in neighborhood commercial streets. It's to get, uh, to reduce congestion because some of the congestion we have in our streets is people looking for parking. And when all the parking spaces are full, people spend more time circling for parking which has adverse pollution benefits, adverse congestion benefits, including that it can slow down Muni. Um, it, it was put in place uh, with a recognition that Sundays are very much like Saturdays now. When parking meters first went in in mid, mid last century, Sundays were a pretty sleepy day. There was not commercial activity on Sundays. That's not true today. Pretty much everywhere in the city that we've measured that have parking meters today, uh, the Occupancy of those meters is uh, 80, 90 percent. So that was the reason uh, that the MTA board uh, made the change in the last budget to, in, to add enforcement of meters on Sunday. From what we can tell, and in, in by the measure of increasing availability of parking, it has worked, not surprisingly. That's why parking meters are there. That's why merchants, in some cases, like parking meters, because it makes it so that people who want to access curbside parking in a commercial area can do so. Um, I, I will note that we did not include the removal, uh, the elimination of Sunday parking meter enforcement in our baseline budget. So the baseline assumes those revenues are still there. Um, if the board were to change that, that would have an adverse revenue impact on the order if it was completely eliminated on the order of I think eight or nine million dollars a year. Um, in terms of the rationale, uh, the recommendation, the idea did not come from us. The MT board actually just adopted this. The recommendation came from the mayor. I think he made his rationale pretty clear. I don't want to try to paraphrase or second guess it. I think it's something that, you know, frankly, a lot of people just don't like. And uh, he felt like it was kind of a concession, I guess, we could make to the public given the affordability issues that we have. But I agree with you, we, you have to pay for Muni on Sunday. You have to pay to cross the bridge on Sunday. You have to, I think if you wanna take an airplane ride, I don't think that's free on Sunday. So that's something that, that my board will have to consider. Hi, I'm Peter Strauss, uh, and I'm here on behalf of, the, uh, of SF True, the Transit Riders Union. Um, I'd like to offer five comments. I think you've heard a lot of this before and you'll probably hear it again, but uh, I'd like to offer five, uh, five tonight. First of all, I don't think it's any secret to anyone that uh, the Muni does not have enough funding to operate uh, the service that it needs to provide, that this is a long-standing problem and there, there really isn't any solution for it. Uh, to it without Muni securing a new source of operating funds. 
Um, there is no better demonstration of this than what in the budget presentation, which identifies beyond the baseline budget over $100 million worth of needs and a paltry 15, well, it's not a small change, but for only 15 to $20 million uh, annually to address, address those needs. And there's no way that that can happen. Uh, SF True feels very strongly that um, Muni needs to develop this new source of funds and the best, perhaps the only source that we see in the near future is the vehicle license fee. We understand the need for infrastructure improvements, but we feel that a significant portion of the VLF must be made available for operating funds. You know, the VLF is an annually recurring source. It's a significant source of money, $70 million. It can be passed by a 50% vote of the public. Um, and there's nothing like that that has the promise of addressing operating funds in the near future. So th this is really, this is not just an opportunity, it is a need to secure a significant source of operating funds out of the vehicle license fee. Second of the, um, there are a number of revenue measures that have been proposed in the budget presentation. Um, frankly, it's hard to take most of those seriously. Uh, they, they, they develop a rel relatively small amount of money to begin with. They're all um, really unacceptable impositions. You mean, the, you mean the fare changes? And I'm not talking about the, this, the, the fare changes, but I'm not talking about the uh, inflationary increase. Right, the, uh, the, the deviations. That, that we're not, uh, not addressing. But the deviations, things like the... Uh, differential fare on the F line, the differential fare on the uh, express, express buses, really everything that's in there is, are, are items that we don't think are worthy of consideration. Uh, and that really underscores again the need for a new and significant operating source such as the vehicle license fee uh, is able to provide. Third, there's one thing that you mentioned um, that we, um, it could be a decrease in revenue, but that we do support, and that's some form of incentive or discount for Clipper card users, um, you know, or, um, or for users, regular users of Muni who don't use Muni often enough to buy a monthly pass but are still regular users and should receive a break. And, and essentially the Clipper card discount is one way of accomplishing that. Fourth, um, I just want to comment on the, the free parking on Sunday proposal, which is something that SF, SF True strongly opposes. Uh, it's extremely bad transportation policy for many reasons, uh, and it's something that the SFMTA clearly cannot afford. And um, last, um, I think the, you know, there are going to be <laughs> um, far more than 15, 20 million dollars worth of demands on that small uh, excess in the uh, baseline budget, but if at all possible, we would like to urge that a portion of that, uh, if anything survives, uh, such as five million in uh, fiscal 15 and 10 million in fiscal 16 be made available for the service budget for service improvements uh, specifically for the TEP. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I guess I'll just make one comment as other people are developing their questions. Um, as great, very clear feedback, which I very much appreciate. Um, with regard to the VLF and operating, I guess I'll just say a few things. Um, to the idea that there's kind of no solution in sight, I just kind of offer that uh, last time around, we started out with pretty significant baseline deficits. This time we're in surpluses. Last time we were able to take about a $25 million bite out of that structural deficit. It used to be more like 70, 75, now it's down to 50. Last time we started in negative, this time we're starting in a positive. Now part of that, or most of that, frankly, is due to the health of the economy and we know it's not gonna stay this way forever. Uh, but we have, been, we have been improving the operating situation. Um, so just, just as, a, as a point of reference, um, what else did I wanna say about that? Oh, and, and that just in, in terms of the part of the logic for the task force recommendations, I, I talked about kind of the general infrastructure strengthening and it, just by fixing our infrastructure, we will pro provide more service. 
because those buses and trains will stay on the road, um, which is part of the logic of the task force for recommending that all of that $2.9 billion go to capital and let the general fund and, and other, other means provide the operating. Um, I also want to note with regard to the, the additional general fund revenues that the vehicle license fee would increase, that when we went to the voters in 2011 with Prop B, which was a $248 million general obligation bond, the, the lion's share of that was about 148 of that was to pay for three years of the gap in the street resurfacing budget that we needed to keep us on the trend, reversing the trend of decades of improving the condition of our city streets. And part of what we said to the voters, what we said to the policymakers at the time was this is a kind of one-time stopgap until we can identify an ongoing source of revenue so that we can continue to improve our streets to get them in a condition that they should be in a world-class city like ours. Uh, streets that all of the transportation system depends on, including Muni, and even more so people walking and biking. Uh, we need the streets to be in good condition for them to be safe. The vehicle license fee, equivalent, the additional general fund revenue that the vehicle license fee provides would be, I think, on the order of 70 or $80 million a year. That gap in uh, to keep the paving program at the level it is, that it is today is about 40 or 45 million. So right off the top, the recommendation of the task force uh, would be, or will likely be, um, to dedicate more than half of the VLF to street resurfacing. What that would leave is a, a much smaller amount um, that also has some specific needs. A general obligation bond, for example, can't pay for any rolling stock. So new buses and trains we can't, by state law, use general obligation bond money for, capital money for. So the VLF would be, or the general fund revenues would be one of the only ways that we could, that we have right now that we could use to buy uh, more rolling stock. Um, add some bike and pedestrian safety improvements that might not be bond eligible. And we've already basically spent the, those general fund revenues um, and still, one thing I didn't mention is even with that $2.9 billion and all the other funding that we anticipate from the federal government, the state government, from the Prop K sales tax, uh, we still have a big hole. The, those two buckets combine what we expect, plus what these revenue measures would provide, only give us about two-thirds of the infrastructure need. So even if we took all of that and, and didn't spend it on paving, put it all into to Muni, we still wouldn't be closing just the infrastructure need. And again, just when we improve the infrastructure, the vehicles, the rails, we're, autumn, we're just by doing that, providing more service. So point well taken, in the long run, we may need more of a sustainable source for funding for operations, but that's uh, anyway the logic behind the recommendation to use these revenues for capital. Any other questions? Comments, recommendations, criticisms? Uh, yes, I totally uh, agree with uh, the girl and the men about uh, the many people that used to come into San Francisco uh, on weekends. Uh, they, they don't come in anymore to buy something or for the restaurants. And uh, I think that this is the problem for the budget right now that is so short. And additional, I think that the service for the buses is not really like, like you say, because I consider I am a, a Muni rider since 2003, and most of my friends, even that the, the, the budget is short for you, uh, they decided better uh, drive their own cars because they say it is different, it's too expensive, better buy one more uh, gallon of gas and, and really take the advantage of the feel better, comfortable, safety, and uh, the, com the, the commodity for, uh, for travel because the bus is very, very dirty. 
They don't have to take, take care of, absolutely about nothing. And the people that is riding is so many homeless. I call it the, the homeless, is, the buses is for the homeless because it's not anything that uh, you can uh, sit down in any place that is clean. You have to stand up for one hour because I come in from Daly City to here, uh, mostly to the second street. And it's a bit, a bit uh, really, um, longest uh, treat, and uh, you say that it, it, I take the aids is gonna be increased, but really what is service for the, for the buses, aids are limited. It is really, the limit it is coming in, in, at the same way into the, no, the regular bus. You didn't see that uh, really you advance too much. Um, uh, really, I say because I am a rider, and I, I say it's every time uh, they are more expensive, but the service is too bad. Yeah, thank you. I think you make a lot of great points. And, and I guess all I would say um, is a number of things that you mentioned are things that we want to try to address. In order for us to attract more people onto Muni, uh, which would be good for the city, and if we do it right, good even for people's wallets, people need to perceive that it's a better way to get around, that it's safer, that it's more reliable, that it's more affordable, that it's clean, it's attractive. Um, and some of the things I mentioned, we, we need to spend more, we need to hire more people to clean the buses and the trains. Um, in terms of the limited being no faster than the regular bus, that's why we need to make some changes in the right of way so that they're not getting stuck with the same traffic problems and at every red light and stop sign. Um, but you're right, those are exactly the things we need to do to make it more attractive for people to, to use transit. And that's part of what we're balancing and we don't want to make it, make the cost so high or the service so poor that people don't want to make that choice, which I know a lot of people have. Yes, sir. My name is uh, Joseph Flanagan, and I'm on the Transportation Authority Board, the Citizens Advisory Committee, and also the MAP. <clears throat> I've been taking rides since August of 2003 on the bus, and I have seen some outrageous things going on on the bus. One of them is the people with developmental disabilities that need 24-hour custodial care. They can't find seats. The wheelchair people who get on the board on, board, on the bus uh, can't make it to the wheelchair left uh, to where the bus, where the wheelchairs go uh, to uh, sit down and enjoy the ride to where their destination is. Other things that go on is the panhandling of other people who are already on the bus, walking up and down the aisles and, and panhandling uh, money from people on the bus. Um, I'd like to, uh, this is a very good program. I support it. Um, I think that uh, we need to um, upgrade the the bus service, which means uh, having more buses uh, taking the people so that we don't have back uh, backlogs of people on the bus, so that more buses are are running and more people can get on the bus safely. Um, the drivers themselves. Uh, I don't find any problems with that. The, the drivers uh, do make announcements on the bus saying that there's a wheelchair coming on board, there's a walker coming, and there's also people with canes that are coming on as well. So the bus drivers uh, 
are okay. Uh, as far as announcements are concerned, uh, I've had numerous number of complaints on on the uh, announcements. People can't hear uh, the driver making the announcement as he stops from destination to destination. Uh, and I think we could improve that by having a better uh, system. Uh, so I thank you very much for your time. And those are my questions and my comments as well. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll, I'll start where you ended, um, which is the drivers. <clears throat> and I, I've, I've come to appreciate, um, since I've had this job, the, the challenge that these drivers face. They have an extraordinarily difficult job um, when you think about the fact that, uh, first of all, just operating these very large vehicles uh, itself, <clears throat> I think requires considerable, considerable professionalism and skill. But then when you add in uh, all of the crazy behaviors that are happening outside the bus and our streets and inside the bus, that, as you referred to, um, often not having adequate facilities, even things as basic as adequate restroom facilities, having vehicles that are breaking down, um, they, they really do an extraordinary job. Um, the great majority of our operators work uh, really hard to provide good service under, I think, very, very difficult circumstances. Um, I think there's certainly improvement for room for improvement in communications in terms of an announcements. Some of that has technology solution and there's some um, <clears throat> investments that we're making or striving to make to improve the communications technology so there'll be more and clearer and better audible uh, automated announcements. Um, and then you talked about some of the other challenges, crowding and, and security and the behavior on the bus. Uh, we have invested, we have added more fare inspectors, so there's a little bit more uniformed presence on the bus. We've been working with the police department to get more police officers riding the buses to bring more of a sense of order to the buses. Between that and enhancing the cleanliness and appearance of the buses, I think we would start to see kind of a behavioral change. But, but I will say there was a comment about the homeless people and people with developmental disabilities. We recently did some uh, demographic analysis. We surveyed riders. We surveyed 22,000 riders. And some of the results were pretty striking. 25% of our riders, uh, based on the survey of the 22,000 surveys, 25% of them report household incomes of $15,000 or less. So many of those are the people who are homeless, who are on fixed income. 50% of our riders reported household incomes of $59,000 or less. So we are absolutely, uh, Muni is serving in many cases some of the people who really have very limited means, have almost no means, who are fully transit dependent, who, who don't have choices about how to get around, who may have whole other issues that they're bringing with them to the transit system. And that's a great thing that, that I think we're doing in terms of enabling folks of those income levels to get around. Um, and that's, I guess, just a reminder to us of kind of the safety net role that, that Muni plays in San Francisco in terms of enabling all San Franciscans to get around. You know, it, it comes with some kind of collateral impacts it means there, there, there can be crowding, there can be homeless people, there are people with big bags of recyclables, there's all kinds of things that happen on, on Muni, but it's, you know, it's part of our kind of the safety net function that we serve in the city. But they are things that we're trying to, to work on and improve. And the more buses we have, or the more reliable the buses are, and the more we can keep them clean and have a decent level of professional presence on them, I think the more the culture of the bus will, will change over time. Thank you for your comments. Anyone else? <laughs> Thanks for the warning. Good evening. Uh, Edward Mason. Thank you, Mr. Reskin. Um, the baseline budget. Um, is that just a continuation, or has there been zero-based budgeting gone into the 
development of the baseline budget it, for it's more or less it's not zero based budgeting not, it's it's more or less taking what we have today and advancing it forward with those few minor adjustments that i mentioned okay um as i see it we're really asking the residents to pay for the planned development area expansions through uh the one bay area plan that's uh, been imposed on us and i view that as really an unfunded mandate uh, through all of the additional development that's going to be in Treasure Island and the Eastern Corridor, Hunter's Point, and into that. Now, I realize some of the developers are paying a portion of the cost, but I don't feel that they're paying the full cost of all of that expansion and development. In addition, I'm sorry to see that the uh, transit sustainability effort has been stymied in not being able to extract from the housing construction of all of the high rise so for every sky crane i see out there i visualize that as money that is not coming to fund the expansion so really what we're saying is we're coming to the property owner uh, as uh, the atm machine to fund all of this expansion now, i'm willing to pay for the replacement of 151 light rail cars but once you start going to 225 or whatever number is going to be there, you're turning to the residents to fund the expansion. And, you know, that's just... The reason San Francisco has gotten into the position it is that the MTC has come and said, well, you've got all this rich transit here, so we're going to put in more housing. And you go down to Palo Alto, uh, there was Maybell Project. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but they were going to upscale the planning requirements for senior housing and some residential housing. Well, the folks in Palo Alto turned around and in a heartbeat after the city council said, well, we're going to leave it up to the residents, in a heartbeat they got enough signatures to put it on the ballot. In this last election, it turned out to be an eight Washington. So now, Palo Alto is faced with saying, well, what are we going to do with this land that we bought? And they're hassling that now. Same thing's going on in San Carlos. So, you know, they want a Sam Trans property down there. They're going to do that. The same thing's going on. And, uh, you know, I'm just wondering if it's bubbling up here in the city uh, as what's going on with all of this additional requirements that are being levied on us. So... I'll continue, uh, go on to something else. Um, we've got a, a policy in the city here for uh, like better streets and all the streetscape improvements and all. Um, my question is, when I look at that, do you want a street tree or do you want Muni to run on time? The reason I bring that up is that the Urban Forestry Council through the planning department has got the urban forest plan. 20-year plan to plant 55,000 additional street trees. Well, the plan that they have really doesn't say this is what the total cost of the plan is going to be for 20 years. It just says on an annual basis, here's a range of dollars depending on whether Public Works does it, whether it's a combination of Public Works and um, uh, nonprofits, and then the rest is going to be contractors. And if you take that range, it's anywhere from for 20 years, $500 million to $850 million at the high end. So it's someplace in between, someplace around there. They say, well, we're going to levy a $100 tax on individual property owners and stuff. Well, you start adding up all the individual property owner taxes and the levies that are going to be starting to add up from a 50,000 foot level, you really start to wonder, you know, well, how much are we going to be able to afford on all of this? So. Uh, there's choices to be made in the city, and I think that we have exceeded our requirements for some of these desires. It's nice to have trees and all that, but there's, you know, there's, there's choices that need to be made, and they need to be brought up to the front and addressed by the populace. Um, does the baseline budget include uh, events paying for traffic control? Now, I look back in the old documents from two years ago, and one of the elements in there was uh, getting compensation from the Giants for that. And I'm just wondering if that's included in the baseline budget or not, if you were successful in being able to. Um, 
uh, for the Giants, no. For special events, generally, partially. So it's partially accounted for. That's part of our structural gap, though, is, is the balance. Uh, with the Giants specifically, uh, the terms of their lease with the Port of Oakland that was entered into when the stadium uh, came into operation prohibits uh, any surcharge for transit or anything else. So that lease would need to be renegotiated in order for that to change. Okay. Uh, police, you know, I look at uh, there's really a lack of traffic and pedestrian and bicycle enforcement by, by the police department. Now, I did see the police department out on 16th Street. I had some friends in town, and we went out to the Anchor Steam Brewery. Uh, that was the first time on 16th Street that I actually saw the police motorcycle detail out there doing some traffic enforcement. The problem is that we go with having all of these movies in the city that I think details the police department. And a perfect example was, I was up at 24th and uh, Castro and looking at all the corporate commuter buses. There were 19 corporate commuter buses that went through 24th and Castro in a one hour period. So there's a Greyhound bus going through the neighborhood once every three minutes, basically. Um, so there were additional buses parked and laying over at James Lick at the ball, uh, on Castro Street. Now Castro is wide, but the 24 bus has to go around it. There were uh, two buses and then another one between Clipper and uh, 26th Street. So after I finished, I started walking down and there's a Starbucks at 24th and Noe. And there was a policeman there on one of these uh, motorcycle dirt bikes. So I walked up to him and I said, are you able to go up and tag these buses that are double parked? He said, no, I'm on movie shoot, because they were doing some movie shoot at Starbucks. So, you know, it doesn't bode well for the enforcement that we're trying to do. Um, another one I'm concerned about, and, and again, I don't have all the information, but internal workforce development. Are we thinking of possibly, you know, we've got an aging workforce, uh, generally, or, in order to enhance new people or entice new people to come in, can we go to the Department of Labor and get some grant money to allow a path of advancement for someone that might be on the fuel island and say, here's a path of advancement, here's all the courses, you've got to buy into this thing, but at the end, you can be a mechanic uh, and show some of this and possibly get some type of grant money in that area. Um, if we, you know, I've always thought that Muni had 4,000 employees for some reason. And now I've heard one time it was 4,700, and I'm trying to figure out where did the extra employees come from because I'm kind of overwhelmed with that number and the growth. And lastly, I think there ought to be legislation uh, for the corporate commuter buses. I realize that this thing has gone through... I'm just looking at the fact that they're really transposing the congestion from the uh, areas in the South Bay to the employee's neighborhood. Um, what they do down in the South Bay is, whether it's Google, Google has spent, uh, as I read in the Mountain View newspaper, half a million dollars on enhancing some of the things in downtown Mountain View for transportation and the ramp over 101 and things like that. But every time these uh, city councils have an expansion that they're projecting, you read the paper says, oh, we got to do something with uh, transportation. So the solution is, well, we'll put them in corporate commuter buses and get the congestion out of our local area. Well, that's all right for that one, but it's the cumulative effect of all of these Greyhound buses that are circulating in the neighborhood now. And with 19 that uh, just for one hour going through uh, 24th and Castro, you know, it, it's a severe problem because they may not come at an average of three minutes. There, a couple of times they were right behind each other. So he's coming down the hill. You've got the green light that then turns red, that turns green again. So he has to go because the guy's blowing his horn behind him, patient. So he goes there, blocks the intersection because the light changes again. That happened twice during that one hour period that I observed. So, uh, and then you got the layover problem. And uh, 
you know, all I can say is from the neighborhood, uh, it's a, everybody's frustrated with you know, the gentrification, all that, that's separate. It's just the fact that these buses are in the neighborhood, Greyhound buses. Now, if they were smaller, like UCSF shuttles, you know, I don't think there'd be that much uh, objection. But the fact that you have double-deckers and something that's like, you know, Greyhound buses, they're bigger than muni buses. And the congestion of going down 26th Street and all of that. So I think I've uh, expended my spleen. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, on the last issue, as, as you know, we've, we're embarking on this uh, pilot program to manage to uh, address some of those very impacts you talked about. Just very quickly, because so, I, I don't want to keep this gentleman any longer. With regard to complete streets, you're absolutely right. We, we prioritize first safety and state of good repair before we start talking about some of the other elements of complete streets projects. But I will say with regard to trees, um, and my former role as being the, the steward of the urban forest here, um, trees are, are one of the most cost-effective pieces of infrastructure that the city has. They provide stormwater benefit. They provide uh, numerous types of environmental benefit in terms of providing oxygen and fixing carbon dioxide in terms of shading that reduces the urban heat island effect. They provide traffic calming. Um, so they're actually a, a pretty good investment in infrastructure. Um, they're, they're not just merely a aesthetic amenity, although they improve the aesthetics and some would argue the safety of a neighborhood too, it's for what it's worth. With regard to development and who pays for it, um, that's a very big and complex question. Plan Bay Area is something that was adopted with uh, input and feedback and guidance and ultimately support from the city of San Francisco. So the idea that it was just imposed by some strange regional entity, I don't think is, is quite the case. Um, it does propose a lot of development to be concentrated in places like San Francisco, where there is density, where there is transportation infrastructure. It also recognizes that there's a gap. Uh, I think it's $16 billion worth of capital back gap in the big transit systems. So while it doesn't solve the problem, so you're right, in a way it's kind of like an unfunded mandate, it recognizes it, and like I said, MTC is already stepping up to try to help address some of that. We do have development fees here in the city. You're right, they don't apply to residential units. Um, although in many of the big plan areas, such as the Easter Neighborhoods Plan and the Market Octavia Plan, um, I do believe the residential units pay, pay the development fees as well. So in a lot of areas where the city is growing, the, those units are paying for development as well. And then of course, when you say the property tax pay, payers will fit, foot the bill, all of those new residents will be contributing to that bill. And with the very large developments, uh, the developers are paying for the majority of the infrastructure. So at Candlestick Point, Hunter's Point, uh, tre uh, Treasure Island, the developers are paying for the most part for the new additional transportation infrastructure. Uh, but you're right, all of the growth, all of the transportation needs that the growth will bring is not funded. And that's part of what we're all trying to solve for here. Thanks for your patience. Um, I'm Eric P. Scott. It bothers me when the people who play by the rules are the first that you come to when you want additional sources of revenue. I get the sense that you see us as, as easy marks and I'd really like you to try to get the revenue that you're entitled to before you come after us. There are many lines where I see rampant fair evasion. I see people selling transfers, and they have huge stacks of them. They're out on Market Street, they're at 16th and Mission. There doesn't seem to be any enforcement. Right outside this building, we have these, these uh, lanes that say bus taxi only. And they are, they are violated every few minutes, and yet nobody enforces those. And I just see money slipping through your fingers. I think you need to go and, and work on, on the revenue side of things. I'm also not a big fan of, of the giveaways. Um, e even though I myself would personally benefit by them, I don't really want to see the needs-based 100% discounts. Although I was thinking about it, I said, that, you know, I think there's one exception that I would make. There is one class of the general public who I think probably deserve free muni travel, and that's jurors. And there are other cities that 
you know, provide, you know, transit for jurors so that they don't, you know, try to bring their cars in or whatever. And it's just a few people, it's for a limited time. It's not a great expense, but it, it's something that helps take some of the sting out of, out of that. I have completely forgotten what the other comments I was going to make. So well, well let me speak to the to the particularly the yeah. enforcement question, and maybe it'll yeah, maybe. come to you. Yeah. So you're right; uh, there are opportunities that that we're losing. We we had done in terms of fair right. enforcement. We did a study a few years back and estimated about 19 million dollars mm -hmm. uh, in lost or foregone revenue from fair mm -hmm. avoidance. Um, it was based on that in part that we increased the number of fair inspectors we have. Mm -hmm. um, I, that coupled with the free muni for youth, I think probably we haven't up, updated that study. I'm guessing that that fair avoidance number or loss is down. At some point there's a cost benefit to how much do we spend enforcing. If we spend more that we're enforcing than we're losing, obviously there's some diminishing returns there. Um, but we, we have been uh, trying to work uh, to make it easier for people to pay, to make it more affordable in some circumstances. There's still some loss losses. With regard to uh, transfer sales, uh, we've been working closely with the police on that. They have been making some arrests. We've been reducing the number of transfers that we provide to our operators in the first place so that there's kind of less supply out there for people to sell. So we're trying to address that. In terms of the transit-only lanes, the staffing of the police department has, had been declining for quite a number of years, and the traffic company, who are the folks who primarily do the, that kind of enforcement, has been really down, like to maybe 50% of where they should be. With the mayor and the board of supervisors funding police academies in this last year's budget, they're starting to ramp up, and we should be up to full strength in the traffic company soon, I guess. I don't, I don't know what the timing is. Uh, and we've been working with them closely on identifying to them the, our priorities from the transit system in terms of where's the enforcement most needed. Um, so we should start seeing more of that. Uh, we're hopefully going to be able to, we're going to colorize some of the transit only lanes right here on Market Street soon. Uh, we might try to expand some of them if we can, uh, coupled with enforcement. We think that'll, that'll help Muni a lot. What we've also done is we're putting uh, forward-facing cameras on more of our buses to do automated enforcement of transit-only lane violations. The way the state law works right now, we can only do that enforcement for parked vehicles. We can't do it for moving vehicles because that's a moving violation which we can't enforce, but that's a step too. So you're right about all those issues. We are making some steps and directions to try to capture, not so much for the revenue, but to, to make the system work better, and if it has a revenue benefit, then all the better. So in the specific case of uh, market at, at Van Ness, I have noticed that a large number of the violators have brand new cars with no rear plates. And it sounds very much like the same problem that they've been talking about on the Bay Bridge. Oh, interesting. I'll pass that along to our yeah. to our uh, police colleagues. Yeah. I, I like the, the idea of giving a discount for using Clipper. I think that is one of the ways that you can help uh, coax people off of the paper transfers. Right. However, there, there is an aspect of the transfer policy that, that has irked me ever since uh, Clipper was first introduced. And that is uh, in regard to the late night transfers. Uh, for the people who, who don't know about this, if you pay a cash fare on a surface vehicle after 8.30 p.m., you get a transfer which is valid until I believe it's 5 a.m. the next morning. Uh, I, I am in favor of this policy. The problem is the Clipper implementation does not respect it. It gives you 90 minutes regardless of, of the time. And I see that as an, as an obstacle to getting people um, to, to transition over. And so, you know, if you can find in your heart to pay Cubic for the necessary change order or convince MTC to, f to f foot the bill for, for that, um, I, I think that would really uh, be a step in the right direction. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm going to yield the microphone if there's anyone else. Anyone else? We're a little bit past our time, but if anyone else has any comments, be happy to take them. Oops. 
My name is Cindy Bakir, and um, you mentioned some some uh, about the pave, paving that's been funded and it's being done in the city. And as a cyclist, I can really appreciate every inch of new pavement. I mean, it makes a a huge difference for me. And fortunately, a lot of the routes I use are being paved all over the city. I mean, out of Richmond, South of Market, you name That's it. That's deliberate I mean, because we're pri prioritizing uh, paving on the streets where there are bike lanes and where there is transit. It's making a huge difference. It's a, a, I really appreciate it. And um, again, as a cyclist and using the uh, existing bicycle infra infrastructure, I can really see the difference year by year uh, and the increase of, of, of bicycle commuters. For example, now spring is coming, the days are starting to get a little longer. I have the reverse commute out Cabrillo um, to the VA, and so the people heading downtown now are like, it's doubling, it's tripling, because now people are starting, you know, starting to get their bikes out and ride, and it's really exciting to me that. So I would just um, encourage I mean, I was really happy to see this goal is making some of these alternative, like car sharing and biking um, uh, means of travel uh, more attractive and preferred. And I, I would support dedicating more budget towards these, you know, actually, I think relatively, relative to some other things, inexpensive fixes that can be made. And one last thing that's never been mentioned, but I... If you, if you go to the Muni building, like at Masonic there, that's a sad structure. I mean, if it, it's old, it's dumpy. It would be really nice if, you know, somehow, someday that could, you know, become one of these gorgeous glass crystal buildings, you know. I think the morale would improve. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, our facilities are one of the things that we've not had the funding to keep up. I don't know if we want to, that's a historic structure. I don't know if we want to make it a glittering glass building, but it's not great conditions for the people who work there. It's, uh, it's very worn, and that's some of the kinds of investments that these measures that would be, that are recommended to be on the ballot in November would provide us funding for f for the first time, as, as well as to do more and better bike infrastructure. Uh, one quick question. Uh, do you have any control over the towing services? Because it, it was $300 just like a two years ago, now it's $500. Do you have any control over this? Uh, we do have control over uh -huh. that. It's, it's our contract. Yeah. Um, the, it was one of the first questions I got in this job was why is that so expensive and um, can kind of offline provide you with uh, underlying what underlies that cost. Our current tow contract uh, is set to expire, I think, in the next year or two. So we will re-compete uh, that, <clears throat> that service. And I'm hoping as we put that back out in a competitive process that we can get that tow fee down. Because I know it's just, it's salt in the wound. It's bad enough that you got a ticket and your car's towed, and then you go and you have this astronomical yeah. bill to pay that. $500. Yeah, it's, it's up on that order. And it's not money that comes to us. It's, it's going through to pay all the costs of that operation for the most part. There's, there's an administration, administrative fee that comes to us, but it's, it's I, I, really, I get a lot of complaints about it, and I would love to be able to bring that down. Any last words? Something that I consider also is, uh, you say in your study that really, uh, for me, is very clear and uh, very understandable. Uh, but I see that you say that the people that pay $2 is the people that can afford that $2. And if you want to uh, take a ride to the bus, you see that the people that take the bus is people that is janitor, is babysitters, is housekeeper, is people that really afford only the, the minimum wage. And I think that that people pay rent, pay bills, pay, pay everything, really cannot afford the $2. The people that afford the more than $2 is the people that ride in the bar. This is that I think, and in my, my opinion. Thank yeah, you. thank you. Our, our, our fares are, are 
pretty good relative to most other big transit systems in the country. They're, they're relatively low. Um, and while everything else in San Francisco is higher than average housing and food and healthcare, everything, transit is relatively inexpensive uh, compared to some other cities. But you're right, for some people, particularly in this economy, it's, it's still expensive. And that's why one of the things we have on the table is looking at ways we can make it more affordable for people who really need it to be. I have a um, few, um, two questions actually. At night in those mini depots where they serve um, trolley coaches and streetcars and LRVs, why is it they're on all the time at night? Shouldn't they be off to save money? And also, um, how, are you, how, how, how is the city saving money on these hybrid buses by using diesel fuel? Thank you. Okay, yeah, two good questions. In terms of the vehicles overnight, uh, there's a couple things that, that are happening. One is the nighttime is when we do the maintenance on the vehicles. Um, that's you know the only time we have for the, the light rail system runs from about 4.30 in the morning to 1.30 at night. Um, so it's a pretty small window we have and many of the buses uh, run a very long day. So that window when they're in the yards at night, a lot of them are being serviced is part of it. Um, there, there has been a practice in some places of uh, leaving the vehicles uh, powered up uh, because of the age of some of the vehicles. Some of them don't like to start back up again. So because we haven't invested in our fleet, we have one of the oldest bus fleets in the country right now, not something we're proud of. Sometimes we uh, are taking some extraordinary maintenance measures that, that may not be cost effective just to try to get the service out the door. Uh, we have been trying to make sure that we're not unnecessarily keeping vehicles on or powered or running, uh, but those are some of the things that uh, make it look like the, the buses are on all night long. Um, in terms of the newer vehicles, what the vehicles we're using now are all hybrid electric. Um, the, the, so just like a, a Prius, they run on, on fuel part of the time and they run ele on electricity part of the time. The fuel we're using is biodiesel. Uh, so it's a diesel with a 20% blend of, uh, of, you know, bio, biomass, you know, from corn oil or from, from French fry grease. Actually, I, I think all of it now is coming from within the city. So the, the Public Utilities Commission, which manages the wastewater system, uh, gathers waste oil and that gets converted into fuel that then is mixed with diesel, which we use to power the buses. The fuel efficiency that we get um, from using hybrid vehicles uh, as opposed to straight diesel vehicles is pretty significant. I think it's on the order of hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. So instead of running fully on diesel, we're running part of the time on batteries. Uh, and that makes it not only better for the environment, but more cost effective as well. <coughs> Now, anybody have a last word? If not, I think we will close out. Thank you all for coming. Thanks for some great questions and comments and the feedback. Very, very helpful for us to have. So I really appreciate you all taking the time. And I hope everybody has a great night and gets home safely. Thank you.